Hello, in this video I'm going to take you through the energy from fuels experiment and a calculation in the National Five Chemistry Unit 2 Nature's Chemistry. So what you should get out of this video is learn how to calculate the energy released when a fuel burns in oxygen through experimentation. So first of all, if we go through what a fuel is, so you need to know the definition of a fuel and a fuel is a substance that can be burned to release energy. Okay, so that's the main definition of a fuel. We then have the type of reaction that occurs when a fuel burns. So when something burns, it's a combustion reaction. And you can get complete combustion or incomplete combustion. Now this is dependent, which one you get is dependent on how much oxygen is available. So if there is a plentiful supply of oxygen, you will get complete combustion. So if you've got a complete combustion, you've got Plenty oxygen. If you've got incomplete combustion, you have limited oxygen. Okay. Now, the two uh, equations for these reactions for complete combustion, we have the fuel, usually a hydrocarbon. Um, so, let's actually just change that to say hydrocarbon. So we usually have our hydrocarbon, so say propane, methane, whatever, plus oxygen, giving you carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so these are the two products that are produced when you burn a hydrocarbon. If you burn a fuel that contains an element, say sulfur, then you would make sulfur dioxide as well. If you your fuel contains chlorine, you would make hydrogen chloride, which is not a very good gas. So you would ideally want to remove these elements from your fuels first um, before you burn them to prevent poisonous gases being released. Okay, so this is the equation for complete combustion. So if I give you an example chemical equation for this, so let's go with ethane, so C2H6 plus O2, because oxygen is diatomic, and then carbon dioxide is CO2 and the water is H2O. Okay, so then if you give it a wee balance, so two carbons, two carbons, six hydrogens, and six hydrogens on the right, and then for the number of oxygens we need, we've got four on the right plus these seven, so we're going to need three and a half moles of oxygen. Remember you can have half moles of diatomic elements in when you're balancing your equations. So that's if you've got complete combustion, so you'll only make carbon dioxide and water. That's when you've got lots of oxygen available. If we have incomplete combustion, we get slightly different products. So we have our hydrocarbon and oxygen still as the reactants. But again, there's a limited amount of oxygen this time. So instead of making carbon dioxide, we make carbon monoxide. So one less oxygen because there's not as much oxygen available. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, and you can make water as well and you also end up making soot which is just solid carbon. Okay, so it's like that black, it's like a black solid that you'll see in your, if you saw a chimney um, or like the is basically it's black. So another example we take the ethane again C2H6 plus O2 giving you CO plus carbon soot plus H2O. You can add state, state symbols to this as well if you wish um, to. So the carbon is a solid, that's a gas, that's a liquid. It's a gas and 
that it will also be a gas. I'm going to put this one up here as well. So, if we balance it this time, we need two of these. Oh, no, we don't. We're getting it right in the suit. So, the carbons are balanced. For the hydrogens, we need three moles of water, which gives us four oxygens altogether. So, we only have two moles of oxygen. So, you can see that there's less moles of oxygen in this reaction, which is why it takes place when there's a limited supply because not as much oxygen as needed. So, things you need to look out for for incomplete combustion is carbon monoxide being produced. This is obviously a poisonous gas, and um, so you don't really want uh, you don't really want to be producing that. So um, you also won't get as much energy being released in incomplete combustion as you do compared to complete combustion. Okay, so that's kind of a quick summary of what fuel is and the reactions it goes through. So we'll go on to the next slide. It's not what I seem to do. Here we go. So the actual experiment. Now this is like a kind of image of how the experiment's set up. Um, I've got a, a 2D drawing on the next slide. But basically what happens is in this can, metal can, you put in a known volume and mass of water. We then take the temperature of the water at the start, heat the water up with our fuel, and then measure the temperature at the end. How much heat the water has absorbed from our fuel source can then be used to calculate um, the heat energy released. Okay, so the temperature change of the water is what we use to calculate the heat energy that the fuel has released. So this is the 2D drawing. So in this experiment we've got a thermometer. Uh, things to notice is the thermometer is placed not next to the bottom of the can. Okay, that's important because your metal can will be most likely hotter than the water. So you don't want to have the thermometer touching the metal can because it will give you an incorrect reading. Um, you've then got 100 centimetres cubed of water here, which is important because we need to know the mass of water that we're heating. Then we've got our spirit burner with our liquid fuel in it. Um, so that could be ethanol or methanol or some kind of alcohol. We then have a metal can. So we use a metal can because that conducts heat better than a glass beaker would. So the idea of this experiment is that all of the heat that's been released from burning the fuel goes into your water. If you're releasing heat and it's not going into the water, it's not being recorded. Um, so it makes your results inaccurate. So anything you can do in the experiment to get as much of the heat being released into the water as possible, the better. So a metal can will help conduct heat into the water. Then we've got this thing around the outside that's called a draft shield. So that basically goes around the whole experiment to prevent, try and prevent heat being lost to the surroundings. So it kind of creates a wee little area for the air to sort of get trapped. Um, they're not all that effective, but they maybe minimize the heat loss a little bit. So they'll prevent heat loss to the surroundings. Uh, and then we also want to make sure that our can's not too high above our burner because if the can's way above where the flame is, then obviously lots of heat will end up getting lost to the surroundings. But um, I don't worry about writing any of this down because there is a slide about it later on. So we set up the apparatus as shown in the diagram and then we record the initial temperature of the water. So that'll probably be around room temperature, so about 20 ish degrees will be marginally less living in Scotland. Uh, and then we'll burn the fuel for a set period of time. So I picked two minutes, but you could do three minutes, you could do four minutes. One minute you could do, but it might not be enough time to get a decent result. Um, and obviously if you're going to do it for 10 minutes, you're going to be doing an experiment for a very long time. So the time choice is a balance between you know efficiency, time efficiency, and also getting a decent result. So I picked two minutes. And then you're recording the final temperature of the water once that two minutes is up. Then you would repeat the experiment because we always repeat so we can calculate an average. You could then repeat this for different fuels and compare uh, whether ethanol releases more heat energy than propanol or methanol. Um, but you would always want to repeat the experiment for each fuel you're testing just so you can calculate an average.
So if we then look at the results table, we always put our results in a table. Um, so I've just got some raw results here. I've not uh, changed. So if you were to calculate the experiment, uh, just carry out the experiment in the classroom, you would probably have a results table like this. So these are two results just for ethanol. So the exp first experiment and the second experiment. So once we've got our initial temperature and final temperatures, we then need to work out change in temperature because how much the temperature of the water changes, what's going to tell us how much energy was released. So if we do 41 take away 20, that means the temperature change for that one is 21. Sorry, I just don't like writing calculations in the table. I think it's really messy. And then for experiment two, we've got a temperature change of 22. Please remember, units go in the heading of the table, so you don't need to write them next to the numbers, because again, that just looks messy. So now we can calculate our average temperature change. So remember to calculate an average, you just add them together and divide by the number of the numbers. 21 plus 22 the two which would give us 21.5 degrees celsius so that's the temperature change we're going to use for our calculation which brings us on to our calculation so the equation we use for this you can find in the front of the data booklet h equals c m delta t so i'm going to take you through what all the variables stand for so eh is entropy change or the energy change so entropy is just a word that we use for energy in chemistry. So entropy change, and that's given in kilojoules. Okay. Then we've got C, which is a constant number, so that doesn't change unless you change the liquid you're heating up. But C stands for the specific heat capacity. Okay, and that's usually of water. It's usually this experiment's done with water. However, if you come across a question where there's another liquid being used, then you would have a different specific heat capacity. But that can be found on the contents page of your National Five data booklet. If it's a higher data booklet, it's on the back page. But it that number is has the units of kilojoules per kilogram per degrees Celsius and for water it's specifically 4.18. Okay. Um, the specific heat capacity is basically just how much, how many kilojoules of heat energy water can hold for every, or how many kilojoules of energy it takes to heat one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Um, so if you were trying to heat one kilogram of water by one degrees, you would need 4.18 kilojoules of energy to do so. And then the last thing, or sorry, the last two things, so M is the mass of water. Okay, and that has to be in kilograms because our specific heat capacity is per kilogram. So usually the mass of the water will be in cubic centimetres, which one cubic centimetre of water is equal to one gram, conveniently. So to change the grams to kilograms, you would divide by 1,000. Okay, but we'll look at that when we go through the calculation. And then the last thing is delta T. That is the change in temperature. And that's given in degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's all the different variables in the equation. So what we can do now is use this equation to work out the energy we released when we burned the ethanol for two minutes. So uh, once you've got your numbers, it's literally just a case of plugging them in. So it's fairly straightforward. So C is the specific heat capacity of water. That never changes. So that's 4.18 times by the mass of water. Now on the last slide, um, it showed you on the picture that we had 100 centimetres cubed of water. That means that's 100 grams of water. So then in kilograms, if you divide by 1,000, that is 0 0.1 kilograms. So it's the 0 0.1 
that we plug into the equation. And then times by the change in temperature. So this is our change in temperature here. That's 21.5. So then if we plug that into the calculator, 4.18 times 1 times 21.5, that gives you 8.9. Eight, seven kilojoules. Now you can round that um, if you want to as many decimal places as you require as long as it's correct rounding. So I'm probably just going to round it to 8.99 kilojoules. You could round it up to just nine kilojoules if you wanted. Okay, so that's the result from our experiment there. So you will want to copy this slide down. I kind of talked about it before, just the things you can do to uh, improve the accuracy of your experiment. So issues with the experiment are that heat could be lost to the surroundings. So then detailed there are the three things that we do to try and minimize that happening. And then the other thing that can cause you to have inaccurate results is that incomplete, incomplete combustion could have taken place. So, that means you don't get as much heat energy out as you would have if it had been complete combustion. Ways you can get around that is by using a fancy thing called the bomb calorimeter, which you wouldn't really be asked very much in National 5. That burns the alcohol, in the fuel in pure oxygen, so 100% oxygen, and it's in a ca encapsulated tank with water all around it, so there's no possibility of any heat being lost to the surroundings. Um, but you can always Google it if you want to have a look, it's one of the least interesting things you'll probably see that's known as a bomb calorimeter, but there you go. So then I'll take you through one more example and then there's a few questions for you to try at the end. So we've got 100 centimeters cubed of water again, temperatures that were recorded and we're to calculate the heat energy so that means we're calculating heat H. So if you're ever asked to calculate heat energy, you're going to have to use this equation at some point, so you might as well write it down. So then C is 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. I like to write the units down because it reminds me to change the water to kilograms. You don't have to, okay, so just don't forget to change to kilograms. So the mass of water would be 100 grams, which if you change to kilograms, you need to divide by 1,000. So that again would be 0.1 kilograms of water. And delta T, the change in temperature, will be 27, take away 20, which you can do without a calculator or with to give you 7 degrees. So now we have to do is plug the numbers in. So we've got 4.18 times 0.1 times by 7. And one for the strictly fans there. And that gives you 2.926 kilojoules. So I'll just round that to 2.9. Okay, so there's a few. I'll flip through just now. You can pause the video as required to try yourself. Um, and then I will put the final answers at the end so that you can check you've got them right. And there's your answer. So hopefully you got them all right. These would usually be worth two marks in an exam, SQ exam paper. Um, so you get a mark if you use the equation correctly that you just put the wrong numbers in. Um, you get the two marks if you get the final answer. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you.